And as the children are being dismissed, all children up to fifth, excuse me, sixth grade can be dismissed at this moment to go to their service, while the rest of us take our Bibles to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter 5 this morning. One other announcement that I did not make is if you have a tithing packet, basically means you're giving to keep on record. Um, we have the tithing records are available back on the Welcome Center desk. If you don't know what the Welcome Center desk is, as you're leaving the auditorium into the foyer, the le- going down the long stairs in the left-hand side. At the bottom is a desk. Uh, that's the Welcome Center desk. And on top are the tithing st- giving statements for 2014. Let me explain real quick what that means. Uh, right now, the government allows us to take a money given to religious institutions as donations to charity. But you obviously have to have proof of it. So as you give, either giving by your name or a number that we give you, and the purpose of the number is nobody knows who's giving what. It, it, you just become a number in our system, and that number is given back. You look for your number, and you take it out, and, um, and so nobody else knows what you give. And you use that if ever the uh, government audited you for what you're giving. And uh, we do want to worship. It is, it is an aspect of worship, but as long as the government gives us the opportunity, we take advantage of that. And uh, if maybe you're not participating in that, And uh, this is not a message on giving this morning, but you think about it as we invest all that we have into God, the opportunity to give, just a portion back. And trust me, I guarantee you, it's totally different than the thinking of the world. The world says take, take, give, you know, and take as much as you can and put it up. And and yet I I do enjoy the commercials. Uh, uh, Some of them, they talk about giving, you know, towards military and they come home. And I think those are great causes. And I think they're good things. Uh, But as we said earlier, this is more than a cause. This is one, obedience and worship but two, investing into eternity as we give. So, but if you've, if you've given and you want your form, that'll be down on the Welcome Center desk after the service. Galatians chapter 5. This morning we're going to be talking about simply this, serving one another. We mentioned in the series Family 101 that uh, basically it deals with relationships. It's not strictly just a series on, on family. It's how, what are things that are needed in family. And obviously one of the keys is service serving one another. Um, what will happen is, as many of you know, uh, one of the three classes, or two of the three classes offered, Brother Nobellini has his class, and then two more classes, one for younger generation, one for uh, those of parents of teens, uh, and above would be, they'd be in, in, that, in that separate class, and the idea is you'll watch him teaching on a video and discuss in more detail what I'm talking about this morning. You come and ask questions, you get to talk about different things, how to do it type of things. And uh, so if you didn't come last week, I guarantee you can come any week. Because every week's a brand new topic. So it's not one of those where I missed one. If you only make one of all of the different things, it's great. I hope you can try. And I understand some can't because of work. Some say, I'm leaving work at 6 o'clock. Well, come in your work clothes. That's fine. Come and uh, have an opportunity to come in fellowship. And, uh, but tonight, uh, two of the classes will deal with serving uh, one another this week, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. This morning, we're going to give to an extent an overview of what it means to serve one another. Galatians chapter 5, beginning... In verse number 13, the Bible says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Father, I pray you help us as we look at this passage this morning to give us a full understanding of what the passage is saying. But beyond that, Father, a practical application that we can take home with us. Lord, that we can look at some truths that are not just great facts, but, Father, things that will help us even today as we strive to serve one another. Help us, Father, to do what you did to us so many years ago and help us to apply these principles not only to our marriages, to our homes, but, Father, also uh, in this ministry here as we serve you as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing we have to look at before we can build stronger relationships, any kind, marriages, homes, church relationships, we must learn to serve one another. By the way, this goes against everything you've been taught, probably, in general, if you listen to worldly thinking. The worldly thinking is get. The worldly thinking is work your way to the top. The world's thinking is that someone else do for me. In today's culture, when we talk about serving one another just for the point of serving, many look back and say that's, that's just ab- it's abnormal to what we've been taught. The Lord truly teaches us to be servants, and the world teaches us to take care of number one, which obviously is us. Today we want to see the idea that serving is more about my heart than it is about my actions. 
four things from this passage today that deal with the idea of serving. Number one, we're going to see the concept of serving. The concept of serving. In this passage, when it talks about serving, uh, throughout the New Testament, there are two different Greek words that are used. I don't talk a lot about that, but it's interesting in these two ideas. One is doulo. This word means to be a slave, to serve, or to submit to someone else. The diakono word means to minister to someone else. That's where the word deacon comes from. In this passage, it deals with doulo or doulas, which is servant, a slave. Paul says, I, the servant or the slave of God. Now, why the term slave? Well, simply this. When I serve as a slave, I don't serve and do the things that I desire to do. I do the things that my master commands me to do. So that's the idea. When I serve my wife, it's not that she's become my master, but her needs, her concerns, her desires become more important than my own. When she serves me, her need, my needs and desires become more important than her own. That is the premise of serving. The first thing we see is the hindrances to serving. Service, serving is one of the greatest contrasts to the emphasis in modern society. Think about some of the titles of current magazines. And you look through Walmart. I was at Giant this morning, and there's all these magazines. And usually there's some kind of phrase about you and you deserve it. TV articles, you deserve it. You know, you say, yeah, I do deserve it. I'm going to go $10,000 in debt to buy that makeup because I deserve it. You know, and that's what, and they're sitting back saying, yeah, we deserve your money. Give it in. You know, that's the idea. The whole premise, I mean, magazines deal about me and myself and my needs and my rights and my interests. And that's what it's about. The culture feeds you and, and wants you to fill your own desires. And as long as we're busy taking care of me and myself, I will never be able to see the needs of others. I'll never be able to find help. By the way, I end up lonely. You know what happens when you get into a marriage? And both sides go into the marriage with this idea. I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that, I'm going to get this. And they have this idea that the other person should be giving. The problem is, if both go in with that idea, you know what happens? Both come out empty. No one's giving, they're taking. My wife should give me this much, and my wife should take care of me, and my wife should do for me. When I come home, she should have my slippers ready. She should have dinner out there. She should have my favorite drink ready. You know what I'm talking about, right? And when it's all done, she brings me dessert. Some of you guys are like, hey, this is good teaching. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And the wives are saying, I'm leaving. I'm done with this guy. I'm out of here. Now, the wives are thinking the husband comes home, and there is the leaky faucet to fix. And then there's this project to do. And there's help with homework for the kids. And there's all these different things. And, and the husband's coming home thinking, what are you talking about? I've worked hard, and I've put in my time, and I should be able to sit down and do nothing course in today the wife's like so have I and I want to sit down with nothing too and what happens is there's a fight and there's a fight about I want I want I want now if let me give you an example I, I might have told if I can't remember if I have or not a young lady I heard the story I don't know how long ago it was she married a guy that she will admit later I probably I should have never married shortly after they get back from their honeymoon the, the husband sits her down and says here I want you to do something for me and he makes a list of all the things that she's required to do for him every morning before he leaves for work and then all the things that she needs to do when he gets home from work. And it was get up a half hour before I do, be dressed and ready to go so you look nice, make sure my breakfast is made this way every morning, make sure my stuff's ready to leave so that I can get up and just leave. It was, it was slavery. All these things. And she got home, there's a whole other list of things to do. As she tells, as the pastor who's telling the story, I will use his words, to her gratefulness, he passed away. Uh, he was a horrible husband. He passed away. She didn't want to get back into a relationship. She had dealt with this horrendous situation. A couple years later, she fell in love. She got married. It was a wonderful relationship. She loved the guy. The guy loved her. The guy took care of her. She loved it when he came home. She couldn't wait for him to come home. She would do all these things. And a year after their marriage, their first anniversary, she did something unique. She was cleaning out stuff. And she noticed in a shoebox the list that her former husband had given her, of all the things that she was required to do for him. She sat down and looked at that list and began to cry. You know why? Without even noticing it, she was doing the same things for her, new, her current husband. You know why she did it? Because she wanted to. That's the difference. When you love someone that much, it doesn't bother you to serve them. It doesn't bother you to help them because you love them that much. But if I'm if I'm all about me, that hindrance will hurt me. Not only the hindrance of serving, but to the freedom to serve. Sin, the flesh, makes it hard for me to overcome these hindrances, but I don't have to live under these battles. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk, at, walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, excuse me, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. When I get saved, I no longer have to be under that bond. I don't have to be driven by my flesh. I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, and I can serve because I have freedom to do that. Isn't that a crazy thought? Think about it. I have freedom to serve. I don't have to do it. When I serve my Savior throughout the week, I don't have to do it. God is not going to you know, judge me in my sleep because I don't serve. If I decide not to read my Bible, if I decide not to pray, if I decide not to come to church, God is not going to be angry. He'll be disappointed. He will miss the fellowship time. But He's not going to be angry. I do those things. Why? Because I love my Savior. And I want to. I want to know more about Him. I want to know how I can please Him better. And I have the freedom to do that. Paul's concern in his letter to the Galatians is that we don't use this freedom that we talk about in Christ to indulge in ourselves or our sinful nature which we still have, even though we are Christians. Paul wrote this, we are to serve one another in love, not according to our flesh. In love to someone else. Not only the concept of serving, number one, number two, the recipients of serving. Now most would say, wait a minute, recipients, if you're serving somebody, it makes common sense that you're going to serve someone else, right? You know what I have seen over the years? Is that sometimes we serve for one purpose. If I do this for so-and-so, they'll do back for me. One of the things that uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we had uh, the snow that still won't melt, just won't go away. It's just, it's horrendous. But um, my, my, my younger, younger two children had stayed at my in-law's house. And so they drive by, they get out of the car, we're getting shovels, we're getting boots. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no snow on our driveway. And that was my first thought. Pretty selfish, huh? And so they go, no, 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 no. They were driving from his house to our house, and there was an older gentleman that was out shoveling his sidewalk. And they realized he's too old. So they went home, and they got shovels, and they went out, and let's help him. And they're shoveling away. And now, he, the first thing we want to tell us is, don't look for money. No, 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 we just want to help them. And they did. Now, you know, every once in a while, people, you know, feel bad. They give out. You know, you don't know if they're going to hold money. He came home with Nutter Butters or something like that. That's what they came home with. We're all like, ooh, free food. But here's the premise. It's not about, let me drive down and see how many people I can milk money out. That's sometimes what we do. Now, don't get me wrong. I think one of the greatest things you can do is go to people who can do it and say, for so much money, I'll shovel your sidewalk. I think it's a great job. It's great work. It's great that I don't have to do it. You know, I have no problem with those kind of things. But the premise is that when we serve, it's not a self-serving thing. And what can I get? I am serving someone else. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man at his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. To look at that verse, we must do a couple of things towards the recipient. Number one, serving requires an emptiness. I love the phrase, it takes two to tangle. You can't fight yourself. Well, you can, but that's a different subject in itself. So if you do that, we'll have a different counseling session. But um, you can. I mean, if you start getting an argument, it takes someone else to argue with you. I'll never forget once, I think I was in high school, and one guy, he just wanted to prove another guy wrong. And they were just screaming at each other. Well, the one guy was screaming. He said, God, you're doing this, you're doing this. And the other guy said, yep, you're right. Yep, you're right. He said, no, you're a jerk, you're an idiot. Yep, you're right, I am. No, you're, you're ugly. Yep, you're right, I am. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you stink. Yep, you're right, I do. And the guy goes, you're an idiot, you're a jerk, I can't argue with you. And walked away. The guy who was yelling got angry and angry. And the guy's, yeah, you're right, I am. Yep, you're right. And he didn't argue back, and it just, and the guy got mad and walked away. And I'm watching thinking, that that's funny. That's great. You know, a soft answer turns the way we're at. But we, one, of the, one of the things we must do is we must understand that serving requires an emptiness of myself. This is definitely not the natural bent. Because we strive because we, we strive with others because we believe we are right. Because we believe we deserve. And we don't like how we're being treated. We cannot serve and be concerned with ourselves at the same time. If we're going to serve someone else, if we're going to serve our spouse, if we're going to serve our children, if we're going to serve others in our church, others in our community, it cannot be, well, I have this and I have that and I have too much time, or why did you call someone else to help me? We should be looking for opportunities to serve. When I have a chance, hey, I'll be there, I'll help you. I may break it, but I'll come and try. Let me get, have an opportunity. We're looking for opportunities. Why? Because it's not about, well, you know, I would, but 
I would help, but I've had multiple people say, anytime you need help doing a project, give me a call. Sometimes it's like, you know, when you call, they don't. I had one this morning. I, thought, I was telling about my project. Was, you should have called me. That's different than you usually hear. And, but, it's, you know, the idea is looking for service opportunities. Give us an opportunity. It co- requires an emptiness. Number two, service, serving requires a proper perspective. We must view others and their needs more important than our own. You know, I was thinking about something this week. And this is just, in my own personal walk, an interesting question. Do we spend as much time praying for someone else's needs as we do asking people to pray for our needs? That hit me as I was thinking about this, personally. Do I pray as much for the needs of the people in our church as I do asking them to pray for my needs? It's a whole perspective thing. If my entire time of prayer request is to let everybody else know, and by the way, I think it's necessary to share a prayer request. The Bible says in, on, the, on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they that mourn, for they should be comforted. Mourn, bring, bring to the outside what's happening on the inside. If you don't share your burdens, we can't, how, we can't pray. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying is when I share my burden, am I taking the burdens of others and putting them on my shoulder and praying for them as well? Serving requires a perspective where I see their need, and I see their need is more important than my own. Husbands, do you love your wives? As much where they're more important than you are? Do you love your wives more than your hobby? More than the game? More than your job? Wives, do you love your husbands so they must be more important than you are? The things that they want, are they more important or is it all about me? Children, have you learned your place and how you can enjoy great relationships by helping in the kitchen? I've talked to kids throughout the years. Why should I do dishes? I didn't make the food. You ate it. Yeah, so I cleaned my plate, licked it up real nice and neat. You know, I can put it back in the, you know, in the cupboard. That's just gross, by the way. Why not? Have a chance to serve. My youngest one, I was moving some wood flooring yesterday in the big container, and he went to pick up the other end, and I'm thinking, this is, this is not a light box. You're not going to be able to do it. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? I'll just give it a shot. If he drops to the ground, we'll see. And, and I went over to help him, and he's standing there holding the other end, waiting for me to pick it up. I'm like, yo, dude. Man, that's cool. And I pick it up, and he shoves me into the room. He said, like, come on, Dad, let's go. Thinking, hey, I'm going to stay here. You grab the other one, okay? He was right. You know, I'm thinking, he can't do it. He goes, Dad, let me help. Let me do it. Let me get involved. It, it's something about the perspective. I want to help someone else because I see their need more important than mine. Serving also requires an action. It's not just about hey, I see the need, yet they truly have a need, and I really hope someone fills that need. You know what? I see the need, so I'm going to call the deacon, and I'm going to tell them that they need to help them with that. And that's not a bad thing. I think we can do it. Sometimes we can just help with the need. It's a perspective, and it requires action. Not only the concept and the recipients of serving, but also the example of serving. Turn over to Philippians 2. I don't know if it's up on the screen, but Philippians 2. We're going to be there for a second. I want you to see this passage. It's a longer one. I like. If I'm going to read a longer one, I like you to be able to follow along. Just a couple books over in the Bible, Philippians two. As you're turning there, let me. You know, we talk about Jesus as an example. You know, one of the battles of that is, well, he was perfect. Of course, he served. I can't match that, right? We've all been at that point, so I don't even try. And sometimes, because the example of Jesus, I don't want to be disrespectful, but because we use it so much. Yeah, whatever. I can't do that. I'm human. He's not. There's no way it can happen. But let me encourage you. I will never be identical to Jesus. I will never do as much as he can because I do have the sin nature. I don't believe he did. Having said that, we can learn from his service and take that example. So Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. By the way, servant or slave, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's look at a couple of things about his example. Number one, his position. 
Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. He was an authority. He had, he had everything you could possibly want, and he looked down upon us, and he looked upon our sin. He looked upon the plight that we deserved hell. Why do we deserve hell? Because of our actions, our decisions. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Jesus looked down, and he saw me. He saw you. You say, wait a minute, that was a long time ago. He's not limited to time. When he looked down, he saw all of humanity, including us. And he said, if it's not for me, they will go to hell, and I don't want them to. I created them, I love them. So in his position of authority, he said, I don't need to be in this position. His perspective. It says that he took upon himself the form of a servant. This was not about some enforcing it on him. He took upon the physical form of humanity. He was not too good to accomplish this task. He was not too good, even though he was God, to come down and live on this earth. He was not too good to be born in a manger. He was not too good to stand in front of a, of a fake uh, a court case. He was not too good to be beaten. He was not too good to be draw, dragged up to Golgotha. He was not too good to hang on a cross and look down and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He loved you so much that his right and his position where he could have stayed in heaven, he wasn't too good for us. He went beneath us and he said, I want to be next to you. I want to serve you. I want to love you. I want to help you. And then I want to hang on the cross and I want to save you. That was his perspective. That our salvation, our life, our eternity was more important than his comfort and his position. There was also his purpose. Why? Would he leave heaven? Simply this, you, me. I've heard preachers say this, and it's so true. If you or I were the only ones that had ever been created, God still would have died on the cross. When he died on the cross, he didn't think about the billions of people that would live throughout the history of mankind. He was thinking about you. When he's hanging on the cross, and God placed the punishment of all of my sin and all of your sin upon Jesus. All the sins that men will have committed will ever have committed to that point. And later on in the future, as he dealt with all of that guilt and all of that struggle and all the things we deal with, he did that billions times over. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. When he looked up to Jesus and he says, into thy hand do I commend my spirit, he was thinking about us. Why would he do it? Because his purpose was he loved us so much. You understand, when we're involved in serving in our local church, we give, we serve, and we witness for the exact same purpose. When the offering plate came by and we gave today, it wasn't a religious tradition. It was the same thing that Jesus did when he hung upon the cross. I will give of myself to you. When we invite someone to church to tell them about Jesus, it's not because someone's going to ask us if we've done it. It's because the same reason Jesus hung upon that cross. When we come and we clean a toilet, or we scrub a floor, or we work in the nursery, or we work in a children's class, or we clean or fix things on the property, it's not because we want to be seen. It's for the same reason that Jesus hung upon that cross. To serve. And if the Creator of mankind, the God of this earth, didn't think Himself too good for me, who am I to think I'm too good to serve Him? Boy, may I be part of that. May I be involved in it. May I see the purpose and the passion he had. Not only the concept, the recipients, and the example of serving, but lastly, as we finish, the heart of serving. We are to serve one another in love, in Galatians it says. The first thing is a selfish heart. If we follow the old nature, we will still have, we still have as Christians, our relationships with others can be very quickly become immoral. Catch this. If we do this, our relationships with others can very quickly become immoral impure and idolatrous, idolatrous. As we deteriorate, our relationships will reflect hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions. Why? Because we're going in it from the world's point of view. If you look at marriage from the world's point of view, it will always fail. Unfortunately, Christians struggle with it because we're not looking at marriage from the right. By the way, I think the first thing is make sure you're marrying the right person and then let God be the center of that marriage. But this interesting thought, if I follow the old nature, immorality, impurity, idolatry, de my, they deteriorate, all these things become part of it because Jesus is not the center because I'm letting my flesh run 
that relationship. Same thing in the home. There's anger. There's fighting. Kids don't want anything to do with mom and dad. Nothing to do with the church they grew up in. All that. Why? Because of what they saw at home. Because it wasn't a serving nature at home. It was a selfish nature. The first thing is a selfish heart. Second of all is the selfless heart. By contrast, if we serve one another in love, we will meet one another's needs in, in unselfish ways. The results will be more love among us. People will be joyful and happy. There will be a sense of peace, tranquility, and unity. We will treat one another with patience and kindness. You say, wait a minute, I've heard of that preacher. That's not true. It is if I serve in love. Because if my anger is the result of how someone treated me, but they're better than me, it doesn't matter what they said. It doesn't matter how they hurt me. It doesn't matter what they didn't do because I'm not the most important person in my relationship. Number one, God is. Number two, the other person is. So when I have a chance to serve, I'll do it. Because it's exactly what Jesus put me on this earth to do. He gave me a wife so that I could serve her. He gave me children so that I could serve them. He gave me a ministry so that I could serve you. And He gave you ministry so that you could serve other people. That's the entire premise. Over the last year, tons of people came and worked in a prophet's chamber, some still keeping it clean and everything, putting money and time into this. And so when missionaries come, they can be comfortable. They were serving someone. They didn't even always know who it was going to be. That's the premise. Why do we fix things up? Why do we put money? Why do we do things? So that one day someone can walk through the doors and we can serve them. That's the goal. And as we have more resources, we can branch out and do more in the community and serve more out in the community because that's what God wants us to do and as you participate in that, you are serving with us by giving and doing. But it comes down to a selfless heart. It's clear that we're all to serve one another in love, no matter what our role, what our position in the body of Christ. And our basic motivation is what Christ did for us. Ephesians 5.2 says this, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God, for a sweet-smelling savor. I'd ask you this morning as we finish, are you serving others? Are you serving your families? Are you serving your spouse? Are you serving the church? Are you serving the Lord? If you live your life with the idea of what we can get from it, you'll be lonely. Because the more you fill, the more you put in, the more empty you become. You're never content. But boy, if you look at life and how you can serve, you will have so much enjoyment. If you look at how you can serve your wife, how you can serve your husband, how you can serve others, you will see great joy and great fulfillment when you're able to do for others. Father, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us this morning and the opportunity we have to serve you. Today, as we've learned and worshipped you in singing and in giving, and Lord, in looking at your word, I pray you help us, Father, to get a full understanding of what you have for us to learn today. I pray you challenge us, Father. I pray you draw us closer to you. I pray if there's anyone here that's not 100% sure that heaven is their home, Lord, may they remember your purpose of putting Jesus on the cross, and that was for their salvation. And may today be the day when they accept you as their personal Savior. I pray for those of us who have been challenged this morning to serve. Father, may we have the heart to serve, where we put other people's needs above our own. And Father, through that, build stronger marriages, stronger homes, and a stronger church, and then a greater influence in our community. But I prayed work in our hearts over the next couple of minutes. With your head bowed and eyes closed, please, no one looking around. I'd like to begin by saying those who are uh, coming to baptism today, you can come forward now. Ladies to my right-hand side behind the piano, go through that door. If you're coming to, for baptism today, head on back right now and get prepared so right after we can have the baptismal service. Let me ask you two questions this morning, just before we come to a time of invitation. Do you know what, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you died today, you go to heaven? You say, what do you mean by that? Do you know for sure? If you die today, do you have a 100% guarantee that you'd be in, in heaven today with Jesus? You know, the Bible teaches us that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'd like to ask you, do you know? If not, here's what I do. I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But just a moment, I'm going to pray for this invitation, and I'd like to ask you if the Lord's speaking to your heart today about that need. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to add you to that. If that's you, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me this morning? Again, with no one looking, we're not going to embarrass you or call you out, but I'd love to pray for you. If I you say, Pastor, I'm not sure, would you, pray, would you raise your hand? Just put it back up and back down. I'm not going to embarrass you. Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me this morning? Anybody like that? I'm not sure. I asked a second question. 
Has the Lord worked on your heart about the need to serve and that selfless nature that puts other people before us, before our own? I could ask for a raise of hands, and I think all of us could say we need to do more of it. It's our natural nature to want to take care of ourselves. But I'd ask you in a moment, if the Lord has spoken to your heart, to maybe take some time to come down to this old-fashioned altar and ask God to give you the grace needed. Because we can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to give you grace to have that selfless nature, to see the needs of others, and to actively involved in filling those needs. And as you do that, to be able to reach and to strengthen homes, marriages, our church, and to reach others for eternity. And as we come to this time of invitation, I encourage you to just take some time, maybe on your knees, maybe in your pew, wherever it be, and ask God to give you the strength and the grace to be the servant that God desires us to be. Father, I pray you'd work in our hearts. I pray you give us wisdom now as we come to this time of invitation. I pray, Father, that we would respond as you'd have us to. I pray if there's anyone here that's not sure they're safe, that today would be the day that they would come and accept you as their personal Savior. Father, I pray you'd put your hand of blessing upon these next few moments. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.